All right, well, welcome to our first episode of the conference's Spread Respect Conversations. I'm Kay Bergstrom, the Associate Commissioner at the League, and I'm gonna begin with just a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our moderator. First, it's good to see over 100 coaches that have joined from around the league. That is uh, quite the watermark there. So we're grateful for your investment in this critically important topic and, and just wanna thank you all for being here. Uh, additionally, just to get ahead of a question that we know will likely be asked, we are recording the episode, but just can't yet guarantee that we'll be making it available to rewatch after the session. We're, we're working to try to figure out what is the best way to share these types of episodes in a safe way in the future. So just be patient with us on that. We will be taking questions through the episode, so feel free to submit those through the Q&A button at the bottom. And if you wish to submit those anonymously, please do so just by checking the submit anonymously box at the bottom of the screen. I also just want to bring your attention to our most recent piece on our AE Voices platform. Uh, the conference's own assistant director for operations and championship and someone who I get the pleasure of working with very closely on a day by day, maybe hour by hour, standpoint, Marcus Bishop wrote an incredibly impactful piece last week. Uh, Marcus's story is the sharing of his experiences with racism throughout his life. It pushes us all to take this movement seriously and seize the opportunity to make long lasting and deep change in this country that is so, so overdue. Um, you can type in the bit.ly code at the bottom into your web browser or just click the link in the chat that we dropped in there just a second ago and read the story. Um, we would encourage you to share this with your teams. Your student athletes, um, I think, would find great value in reading uh, this story. So we're lucky to have someone as courageous as Marcus on our staff and just wanna thank Marcus who's on with us today for, for sharing your story and your voice. And then lastly, as always, with the, the primary conversation being between Kathy and, and Tom, we also encourage you, um, you know, to, to join us in the conversation on social media. So use the hashtag spread respect, um, share your voice and your perspective while you uh, tune into this conversation. So with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Amy Huckhausen to who will moderate today's conversation to get us going. So over to you, Amy. Thanks, Kate, and uh, I want to welcome everyone today, too. We're really excited for you to join us here on our first ever uh, Spread Respect conversation, which we hope is just the first of many. Um, I do want to thank Kate and Marcus for their help in organizing uh, this particular event, uh, but also in being our sort of core internal staff planning team as we think about all the different ways and, and frameworks that we want to uh, put together so that we can, as a conference, continue to create change and have an impact in, on these issues. Uh, ever since the murder of George Floyd and the elevation of racial injustice issues in this country over the last few weeks, we have been thinking and discussing how we as a conference can use our Spread Respect platform to inspire, promote, and enable change, and to have difficult conversations. We've been really proud of the work we've done under our Spread Respect campaign over the last seven or so years in the areas of LGBTQ plus inclusion uh, and believe it's had a positive impact in our conference community for both people that identify as LGBTQ plus and for people that want to be allies. And now we wanna use that power of community, that power of that platform and our intention, intentions and commitment to create change in the areas of racial injustice, both within our conference and on our campuses and beyond. This will most definitely be a work in progress. You cannot overcome over 400 years of <clears throat> racism in the United States just with a few webinars and conversations and task, for, task forces. Uh, we want this to be a perpetual work in progress so that we really can look back in five years, 10 years, 20 years and see progress happen uh, in college sports and in this country overall. I've said over the last few weeks that I don't wanna do just reactionary change. I'm not in this just to get a headline. I don't want the America East to be in this to issue the first press, you know, press statement or have the latest you know, social media graphic. But like I said, we wanna work on things that will result in perpetual change so that we are continuing to talk about this in six weeks, in six months, in 12 months, and in two years from now and beyond. 
This kind of change requires individuals to be committed. It requires our institutions to be committed. If we really want to have the chance that everyone's seemingly, you know, proclaimed in their intentions to create change at the conference level. Our presidents, and most importantly, from a direct line of communication to you, our athletics directors and senior women's administrators have been firmly committed to this change as well. They've been really proud of our work and spread respect over the last few years, and they want us and have challenged us as an entire conference and as a staff to, to, to continue to be leaders as we tackle the problems and issues associated with racism. So with that, uh, our first initiative is this. It's the launch of our, these spread respect conversations. As I said before, we hope it's the first of many. We've targeted coaches initially because we know that you're on the front lines with our student athletes. And we know that some of you are struggling with these issues. We know that you, some of you have student athletes who are struggling with these issues. And so we have you at the top of the list in terms of trying to create a conversation just among coaches so that you can learn and talk to each other and learn from each other. I'm very pleased to be joined today by two very special people, uh, Tom Garrick, the head women's basketball coach at UMass Lowell, and Kathy Rahill, the associate AD for student athlete development and academic affairs and the SWA at the University of Vermont. Uh, just a little bit about Tom. He is about to enter his third season at the helm of UMass Lowell women's basketball team. Um, he spent time as an assistant coach at Boston College most recently. Uh, he played in the NBA. And recently during the women's basketball coaches annual meeting, which was held uh, via Zoom, <clears throat> he inspired his uh, fellow America East coaches during a really powerful conversation about race and sharing his experience being a black man in this country and acknowledging the injustice, fears, and challenges that exist and that he faces on a day daily basis. Uh, he strives to not only make his Riverhawk community more inclusive, but has also proven to be an emerging leader in our conference in speaking out against these issues. Kathy is, as I said, the Associate Dean for Student Athlete Development at Vermont. Um, she recently just finished her PhD, by the way, so I should appropriately call her Dr. Rahill. Um, she is a licensed clinical social worker and um, <clears throat> serves on UVM's Athletics Inclusive Excellence Committee which you haven't, I hope she has a, a few opportunities today to talk a little bit about that and certainly can share some resources about what UVM is doing in this area. Um, she also received last year UVM's Tim Shiner Ally Award, which is given to a student, staff, or faculty member who demonstrates a strong commitment to work within the UVM community of color to create social change. Uh, for those of you that joined us in our mental health workshop a few weeks ago, you heard Kathy address our coaches at the beginning of her session about um, <clears throat> these issues of racial inequality and using this moment to really create change. So for today, we wanna to spend a little bit of time level setting on what systemic racism is and what privilege is. And then we wanna provide a conversation uh, that will hopefully give you some tools, strategies, and feedback for coaches so that you can go back um, and start to work with your colleagues and your teams uh, with maybe a few takeaways that can help lead to productive conversations. Uh, as Kate said, uh, pop your questions into the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to take them as we go, um, but certainly we wanna leave time at the end as well for questions. So I will dive right into it um, and get to the level setting part. Uh, we certainly cannot cover the history of racism in one hour session. Uh, but I do think it's important to acknowledge and start to get our arms around what systemic racism is. We heard, we've heard a lot of new terms for those of us that haven't spent a lot of time researching or studying uh, the history of racism in this country. You hear things like systemic racism, systematic racism. They are different, by the way. Um, but I think I want, for today, I want to focus on systemic racism. That's the thing that uh, in the women's basketball coaches meetings that I mentioned before, that was so powerful from Tom when he shared his story. So I will ask Tom the first question. Can you maybe share with us uh, a real life example so that we can relate to it and understand it? Uh, what's a real life example of how you have experienced systemic racism as a black man living in this country? Uh, thanks, Amy, for the introduction. That was really wonderful. I uh, appreciate it. 
And I just want to reach out and say to Marcus that he kind of encapsulized it in such an eloquent way in that letter. I think it's really important for all of us to read that. Um, and that's the existence for uh, a young black man every day in this country. So read the letter and you'll have a better understanding. I have so many examples and I'm trying to figure out which one to give, unfortunately. Um, some are more dramatic than others. Um, so I'll, I'll give you that one. So I, I was a senior in college and after I graduated, I had aspirations to go play after college. So my teammate lived in New York City, one of the hotbeds for basketball. So I went to live with him for the summer so that we could work out together every day. So he lived in the projects of Coney Island. I'm not a project kid, I'm from the suburbs. I didn't know anything about the projects in so far as living in them. So I didn't know how to operate on a daily basis. So I went to live with him and he took care of me, showed me around. I stayed with his mom in her apartment um, and he lived across the street with his girlfriend in her, their apartment. So on the weekends, everybody would hang out. There's really nothing else for young kids to do. So you just hang out in the projects near your buildings. So that's what we were doing on a Friday night. And about 12 o'clock, 12.15 on a Friday night, all of a sudden police cars start blaring, sirens start going off and police cars start flooding the basketball court where everybody congregated and you see police running on foot. Everyone scatters. I'm not from there, so I don't know enough to scatter. And the only way I could run was back to the building where his mom stayed and that would be running toward the police. I don't know a lot, but I know not to run into policemen when their batons are out, their guns are out and they're running towards me. So I just stayed still. One of the policemen grabbed me, pushed me up against the wall with a couple of his partners. And I feel like, you know, he's frisking me and I feel a tap in the back of my head. So I'm thinking, all right, he's tapping me with his baton, telling me to stay forward. He frisked me, asked me some questions. They're screaming at me. I've done nothing wrong. I don't know any better. I'm not worried. So about 20 minutes goes by they released me back to where I was hanging out and all of the people who had scattered start to intermittently come back out. And um, I didn't think anything of it. All of a sudden, some of the people that I had been introduced to that lived there were like, yo man, you weren't afraid? Why'd you stay so calm? How come you didn't run? And I was like, well, first of all, I didn't know where to run and why would I be afraid? Because I didn't do anything wrong. And they were like, but no, you weren't afraid when he had his gun on your head? So I was like, well, what are you talking about? He didn't have a gun on my head. I, he was like, yes, you, you didn't feel him hitting you with the gun. So I was like, I was dumbfounded. And I didn't really understand it until a couple of the young girls who were out on the stoop at the time were crying and were just like uncontrollable. Like, that's not fair. He's not even from here. He doesn't even know this. Later, I come to find out, find out they call it the weekend run. Every weekend, the cops used to come through there. That's why everybody knew to run. And the guy who I was kind of my friend put in charge of me to hang out because I wasn't from there. He was like, yeah, that's why they put the gun to your head because you weren't afraid. Like you didn't run and they want to show, they want you to show them respect by being fearful. So that's what he was trying to make you afraid. At that point, I realized that I was in over my head. Here's where, okay, that is systematic racism to me, Amy, but here's where the systematic racism comes in for me personally. I wasn't angry. I wasn't mad. That actually gave me uh, a little bit of a rep in that community for the summer. So kids were coming up to me. I was like, yo, you're not afraid of cops. You're this, you're that. So it all, almost gave me reverse confidence. And to this day, I never speak about that. I was telling my wife this morning, have I ever told you that I had a gun to my head? She was like, no. Systematic racism is that it doesn't even register to me anymore. Now that's where we're wrong. It, it doesn't matter to me. Like I don't even remember that unless I actively try to. I've almost put it out of my subconscious. And that's where we are. That's where I think I am with what systematic racism means to me. Thanks, Tom. That uh, is really obviously a powerful story. And then you introduced a topic I want to come back to, I think, in a minute here. But this uh, reverse confidence, I've not heard that before. But I definitely, it certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, to me. So I'll, I'll slide back to you after we hear from Kathy and maybe share f as, a, as a white woman in this country, you have a very different experience. You know, even if you and Tom had grown up in the exact same <clears throat> but right next door to each other with families of the same structure and income level and whatever, 
your your daily life and your <clears throat> experience would be much different than what he just described. So maybe talk about as a white woman, what is what does privilege mean and look like to those in the majority population of this country? Yeah, thanks, Amy, and thanks, Tom. Um, before before I answer that, I just want to thank you, Amy, and Marcus, and Kate for putting this together and being the leaders in our country on um, bringing this, these issues to light from the conference perspective. Your work on LGBT um, rights and inclusion and mental health and spread respect is um, so inspiring, and it's an honor to be here today with Tom to be able to have this conversation, so thank you. I also want to just say that, um, especially to coaches, I want to say this, I am not an expert on the history of the Black experience in America, even though I have a master's in social work and a doctorate in education. There were very few classes that I took that focused on this, which was somewhat enlightening as I've been thinking about this conversation today. Um, I had great experiences, and I think that my education helped me to dive into this work in a way that's very helpful to me in terms of my learning. But for coaches out there, you know, you, you don't need a master's or a special degree to, to dive into this and try to learn um, and improve your own experience around what racism means and how you can help your athletes. So I just want to say that these degrees aside, they don't matter. Um, if you care, like I know you all do because you're on this call, like, like all of us, um, you're going to do the right thing. I also want to say, um, coaches on the call and Amy and Tom, hold me accountable during this conversation. I think that that's part of this work, especially for white allies and white folks. If I say something that you wanna dive into, let's let's get into it. And I, will, I, I would love to be held accountable for um, how I participate today. Um, what struck me, multiple things struck me from what Tom just said about his experience around systemic racism. One, I have never had a police officer touch me I have never had a police officer put any weapon pointed in my direction or even pulled out of their belt. Um, so, and I don't expect that I ever will, right? And that's such an unconscious feeling and perspective that I have that in some ways is on the other side of what Coach just said, that he is now internalized racism towards him unconsciously, just like I have with my privilege. Because when I see a police officer go by, I know they're not gonna stop me unless I'm maybe going 100 in the 35. Um, and I think that that is something that myself as an ally, I really need to unpack and help myself better understand what white privilege is and what privilege is so that I can try to not be complicit in systemic racism. Um, and when I think about privilege, again, back to what Tom said, there's so, I've had so much privilege that I don't even know, there's so much of my privilege that I don't even know that I can identify. But one piece that I thought might be helpful just for today's conversation that relates to this work is getting my job. Um, my husband and I and our boys moved here in 2000. My husband at the time was um, an F-16 pilot, so we moved here for his, his work in the military. And at the time, I decided to go back to school and become a social worker, so, so did that work and had the honor to do that work for a number of years, and then realized I was really missing sports. Um, and thought, wow, I wonder how I could get back into sports in some way. Um, and I had a bunch of my professional networks. And then I had personal networks, my personal mostly majority white networks. And when I decided that I wanted to get back into athletics, I thought, well, maybe I could work in college athletics. Had no experience other than being a student athlete myself 100 years ago. Um, my background as a coach ended in Little League with, with a big district playoff loss that I'm very proud of. We played very well. But that was the extent of my college athletic experience. Um, I had these other degrees, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I decided, well, maybe, maybe there could be a role for me. So I reached out on a personal level to some folks in the athletic department, was able to have a tour, um, was able to present myself and say, look, here's what I can bring to the table. And with a year, within a year, I was hired um, in, in a role that's different than my role is now. But I was hired and you know, I was banking on my cachet in my, in my white privileged network um, 
that I that I have learned to rely on. Um, so, so Amy, that's one example, um, and I'm sure I could think of more. Yeah, I, that's one thing. You know, if I could offer an observation, as I have heard more stories like Tom shared, like Marcus put in his AE Voices feature, it really, to your point, Kathy, I think for those of us in the majority, and I'm not white, I'm obviously Asian, <clears throat> but which carries its own form of um, racism, but also it's, it's, an, its own form of privilege as well. But I definitely, I believe, <clears throat> have much more privilege than Marcus or Tom or any other black American in this country. And I, I fully recognize that and acknowledge that. Um, but it has reset us and hopefully for those of us that are serious about this, it is causing us when we hear about those stories from Marcus and Tom and our other friends and family members and colleagues to think about what if that was me? I've never had a gun to my head. I've never been stopped. When I stop, I think I've shared this with you guys, when I've gotten stopped the few times I have when I'm driving, I'm thinking, I know, fully know that I, I speed all the time. I drive really fast. Um, <clears throat> I know that I will get stopped, but I, I've only gotten a ticket one time. And I never worry about them when they come up to my car. I'm thinking, I hope they see me as a female, as an Asian look, as an Asian female who looks younger than she is, um, and that doesn't give me a ticket. And you know what? That that works out more times yeah. than it hasn't. And so it's just caused me to think about my world and mm -hmm. my experiences in a much different way. And so, Tom, going back to this reverse confidence thing, how do you think that? Um, I can't remember how old you were, but it was certainly when you were younger. Mm -hmm. How has that helped you maybe, that reverse confidence that you had? Uh, and how do you think it has maybe harmed you in ways that maybe up until now you have not realized? Uh, I don't, I'm, not sure if, I'm not sure it's helped. And I, I, that's hard to say since I've gotten this far in my life, uh, experiencing a modicum of success. Um, I think and Marcus and I had this conversation before we got started today. It's almost like a defense mechanism uh, where we've been taught and, 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 and raised to turn the other cheek so often to not ignore because you know it's there, but to persevere and keep going so it doesn't debilitate you, that I had to figure out a, a, a way to, to make that make sense to me. So the way it made sense to me was I got through it, I didn't get hurt, and I got some street cred when I was 18 years old in the projects of New York um, where I had to live for the summer. So it, 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 it bought me some time to figure out the lay of the land in the setting that I was placed into. Um, so that reverse confidence thing was kind of something I made up in my head, but um, religion is another way that, that uh, manifests itself for African-American people. Uh, we've been taught to believe in a higher power. God will make things okay. And I firmly do believe that. But I think that's a, a systematic way from the time of slavery that we were taught to um, make, your, make your situation palatable for yourself because you're going to have to come back here and work no matter what. You're going to have to figure it out or something bad might happen. So we've always had to figure it out uh, in a way so that we could keep on living. Yeah, almost like a, you have to create a safe space, your own safe space, however you can to whether it's a, you know, clear defense mechanism, an intentional defense mechanism or not, yeah. had to create the space so that you can continue to, to live and not get overcome by the negativity, uh, whether it's implicit or explicit. Right. Um, yeah. That's, that's and, and even if it, and you could say that, well, we're not always at danger, like it was back in those days. But clearly by the things that have happened and transpired over the last couple of months, we are. Yeah. Percentage wise, it's not as vast as it was back in 18, whatever. But the fact that it's still here is the problem. The fact that there, there can be a day where you walk out of your house, run into the wrong policeman, the wrong citizen, think in the wrong way, and you don't make it back. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. Kathy, have you ever, uh, up until the last few weeks, and I, I know you're in a little more unique position because you've studied this a little bit more than probably the average person, um, but have you ever had these kind of conversations around racism and privilege before the last few weeks? 
uh, other than from like an academic perspective, I should say. Right. <clears throat> That's a great question, Amy. We, our Athletics Inclusive Excellence Committee started a few years ago, and we, we have created a student athlete of color affinity group that I have not been invited to attend, which is great. That's the whole purpose of it, right? Um, within, within some of our work, we have engaged in dialogue, but I have to be completely honest. I think that most of our work has been more action oriented versus what's happening here, which is process oriented and feelings oriented, experience oriented, which I think goes such a longer way, you know, and I'm learning here that maybe we need to spend more time learning about the experiences of all of us. I think that there's also, you know, I'm cautious around having any members of any groups that I'm in be forced to tell their story, you know, very grateful to Tom that he's brave enough and willing to share his life experience and expertise so that we all can learn. And we shouldn't ask other people of color to ever have to do that unless they want to. Um, so I think once people feel that there's trust within a group that there can be more dialogue, but most of that Amy has started really since um, this current civil rights movement. And just to go back to what, what Tom was saying before the call, we were talking about, and I think Marcus was also saying, building up this internal resilience that they've had to build up over the course of every day of their lives that I have not had to, um, to build up. And in my, in my most re recent sort of studying about how I can be a better ally, um, I've turned to Robin DiAngelo, and I don't know how many folks on the call have looked at her work, but she wrote um, White Fragility. And the one thing that I've really pulled from her is she is asking white allies to become more resilient in these conversations. We tend to do the opposite of what Tom just said. We tend to get defensive, we tend to cry, we tend to get upset. This is very upsetting. We prefer to have comfortable conversations. So um, I just think it's interesting that these parallels are in some ways so far apart that Tom's been forced to build resiliency his whole life. And now myself at 5051, turning 51 in July, um, has been really focusing on how I can be more resilient in these conversations. Um, and again, it's not about me, but I need to stay in this work. So I do have to figure out me yeah. and my place in this work. So it just, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, you may, I, I really like what you said about we're now, there have been maybe times in the past where it's been about action, where something's happened. Certainly, certainly George Floyd and the, and the, and the <clears throat> black individuals that were murdered by by police in the weeks and months before that were not the first. And there's always been like a spike in, oh my gosh, freaking out, this is wrong. And then the, the next big story comes and we That's all right. Run. And so there's like this brief moment of, um, you know, <clears throat> exclamation and frustration and this is this is terribly wrong. But then we move on as a yeah. society. That's clearly why we're, why we're in this moment today. Um, but I, I, sh I share, I don't know if you express optimism, but I, I share your, what I am, am inferring as optimism, that the fact that we are having, we're taking time to be more deliberate, at least in some corners of the world in this country, to be more deliberate, to have these conversations, actually have this conversation that we're having today, um, <clears throat> and that you all are having on your campuses. I'm hopeful that that's just like one more chip away at our ability and building the capability to actually do something. Uh, I don't think that we will solve this in my lifetime, if I'm being honest with you, but I'm hopeful that at the end of my lifetime, and I hope that that's not like tomorrow, but I hope at the end of my lifetime, um, we will have made a lot more progress here. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I like what you said about the resilience versus defensive. That's really, really, really fascinating. You're right, there's a divide. I think what these conversations are exposing are divide on so many things. Not just that someone gets stopped by a police officer and someone and that experience is different. It's the underlying emotional and intellectual divide <clears throat> that uh, people of color and non-people of color deal with because those are the more like fundamental things that result in this. That's why it's systemic and not just surface or reactionary racism or, or action. Um, it actually leads to one question that just was popped up into the um, chat. <clears throat> um, 
when did you, I, I really like this question a lot. Uh, when did you, a lot, a lot of black or African-American <clears throat> individuals identify and recognize their race right away? Because, you know, they have to, using Tom, Tom's example, or again, going back to what Marcus put in his story, he knows he's black right away because his parents or family members or friends are teaching him, educating them about weekend run and what to do when you get stopped in a way that white people don't have to. So um, I think that that's obvious if you're a black person. But Kathy, since <clears throat> you're, you're not black, um, when did you start to identify as a white person and, real, and recognize that as part of who you are? You're a woman, um, maybe that dawned on you at a certain point in your life, but when did it hit you that you were a white person in this country? I'd say it's still hitting me. Um, it's a great question. Um, and what, I, what I'm learning is that whiteness is really such a location of structural advantage and of privilege. Um, it's a standpoint that my parents didn't teach me about. I wasn't schooled in, in terms of, you know, pre-K through 12. Um, and I grew up in a very white community. And we, white people, tend to not consider ourselves as racial. Um, so I am currently, I mean, I think probably when I started, get, you know, with my work in social work, I started to unpack a little bit of this, but I, I personally have a long way to go to understand what it means to be white, what, what that privilege means in terms of my health care, my employment, my education, my, um, the odds of me ever going to prison, you know, all of those things. And what impact that has, what my impact has on, on my black friends. Um, and to figure out um, that feeling guilty is, is a waste of time. Um, understanding is where the time should be spent, understanding the privilege, and then figuring out what I can do to make a difference. And even if it's just in my family with my two boys, or if it's at work, or if it's on a committee, you know, I think um, these things, especially for, I'm sure many of the coaches on this call can relate to feeling like you're a perfectionist. You get into this business because you are very good at what you do. You want to win. You're, you're success oriented. And um, I'm a little bit like that. Not, not that I've had any success, but just that I want to try to tackle it all. And I, and I can't. And that might be some of my white privilege coming out. Um, to, so to find smaller ways that I might have an impact. And like I said, if it's just with my son or if it's just in a relationship I have um, to talk through that. So I rambled a little bit off the question, Amy, but um, it's an ongoing process and it's a great question. Yeah, really good question. Um, I'll ask one more sort of like level setting question in that bucket and then we'll, we'll shift focus a little bit. Um, I hear a lot, and in my life, we've all heard this, we're color, I'm colorblind, I don't see color in people, everyone's the same, um, <clears throat> you know, just from, I'm looking at just, just from a personal point of view, not in like policies that people have in hiring or college admissions, that's a whole nother animal. But it, as, as the, I've never like understood that, I could never articulate why that didn't like seem to make sense to me. Um, but in the last few weeks, I think it has become more self-evident uh, by, by statements made from a lot of people like that is, and I, <clears throat> this is me expressing my opinion, like the complete wrong thing to say. Right. Uh, and I was, I had the really good fortune yesterday of being in a session with Dr. Condoleezza Rice and she, mm -hmm. what I thought really in a really succinct way, <clears throat> it is one of the most offensive things you can say to me, this is her speaking, is to say that you are colorblind. Mm -hmm. I am a black woman. If you do not see that, what do you see? I am not the same as my white colleague. We, right. we just are not fundamentally in, not just the way we look, but what we believe, what we have learned, where we came from. If you can acknowledge those things, that I grew up in this state, you grew up in that state, I went to this school, you went to that school, and you can acknowledge those differences, but then you like put your blinders on when it comes to the fact that I'm black and, and this other person's not, 
that is, as she said, the most offensive thing you can do <clears throat> and say just with that one statement. So I'm curious, I wanna hear from Tom, your reaction when people, have people said to you that I'm colorblind and then what's your reaction to that sort of proclamation or position? Well, okay, two things. Um, you, you mentioned Condoleezza Rice and being a black female. Let, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the black female is probably the strongest human on the planet, right? With all of the things that have put on their shoulders and on their backs throughout the course of history, um, through the way that young black men in, uh, particularly are raised uh, in the system, the way it's prop uh, presently set up, black women are probably the most powerful people on the planet in my eyes. Um, as far as, um, I don't see uh, color, I'm colorblind. That's like looking at a black person and saying, yeah, but you're different than the rest of them. That's, it goes in the same bucket, right? It, you're, people are trying to homogenize uh, years of oppression and saying, well, it doesn't really exist anymore. Well, I'm colorblind, I don't see that. Well, you have to see it or you're missing the whole point. Like Condoleezza Rice said, you can't pretend not to see it and have that act as in a cure-all. Like, no, we're all on level ground now. No, we'll never be on level ground. So you have to see where I'm coming from if your intent is to either help me or to understand. If you say you're colorblind, that's just, and this is for everybody, that's just this person's way of saying, I don't really want to deal with all that comes with what is getting ready to come from this conversation. So I'm not the person you think is your enemy. I'm colorblind. We're good. No, we're not good. We're not ever going to be good, but we can work towards it. So that's how I feel about the colorblind statement. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a really good lesson, I think, as, as all of us are trying to learn uh, uh, more about this mm -hmm. and we default to the things that maybe we've been taught before. We've been taught through admissions processes or just people like we're colorblind. And I think correcting that now as we get in this conversation, it's no one's fault necessarily if they, if they just don't know any better. Um, but the chance to learn and then adjust, that's where we've got to keep chipping away at some of that stuff if we, if we want to have a hope for change. Um, I'd like to shift the conversation now. We've got about 20 minutes left. But to dig in a little bit deeper on um, how can we be helpful to coaches who are having these conversations with their staffs, just within their coaching staff, but then obviously with, with their student athletes, probably with their parents, with recruits, because that will come now in the wave of questions, I imagine, as coaches are recruiting incoming prospects for the next few years. This issue hopefully is not gonna go away. and It'll be something to talk about. We've got, <clears throat> you know, on the one hand, we're in a very progressive, diverse part of this country, um, being in the Northeast. And I, I feel uh, very fortunate in that regard. On the other hand, we have some states that are have the highest, you know, among the highest percentage of white people and <clears throat> in the country. And so there's a there's a juxtaposition there to a certain extent, being uh, liberal socially on some things, but not having the opportunity to really be diverse from a racial ethnic standpoint in other ways. And so how how are these conversations happening? I guess I'll I'll, I'll start with Tom <clears throat> just because you're you're the coach. I, I had the great opportunity to sit with you and your women's basketball coaches in your meeting and was blown away um, hearing from you and from Janetta as the two black head coaches in that room. But honestly, as much hearing from your colleagues who are white, be honest and open. I'm not gonna reveal anything that they said, but it was just a very powerful conversation of like acknowledgement, um, <clears throat> understanding, acceptance, and a willingness to say, like, I, I don't know what to do. Please, I need some guidance because I want to be better. I want to I want to learn more. Um, so Tom, what are the things, I know you've had these conversations with that group, with people at UMass Lowell. What are the things that are working or maybe not working as you're having these conversations with your, your coaching colleagues? Well, I think that the, the main thing is that um, understanding that the plight of the young African-American is being heard and acknowledged and that you're listening. I think that's that's the biggest takeaway uh, from a coach. Um, we're always in control. We're the authoritarian. Do as I say, not as I do. But to now put those walls down and say, on this particular topic, I'm a novice, 
and I don't know everything and I don't have all the answers. So I want to know what you're feeling so that I can arm myself to best help you. I think that's the biggest thing that I've taken away from this um, and that my coaching colleagues, uh, like you said, um, Amy, they've been unbelievably wonderful in their intent to accept this positions in this thing and to learn and to grow and to help the young people that are under their tutelage. So um, like you said, this isn't gonna be an overnight change. It's not gonna, so we have to incrementally, but we have to start somewhere. And I think my colleagues have done a great job um, in opening up their minds and their hearts to the young ladies uh, that they're teaching. And then how do you, um, you know, think about their, <clears throat> just as we are all different, you know, your black student athletes on your team are experiencing this differently than the, what your white student athletes for the same reasons that we have spent the first 30 minutes talking about this conversation. Yeah. How are those converse, how are you managing those conversations um, with those populations either individually and then collectively? Well, here's how I've grown and, and one of the changes that I know I have to make. So for all of my career as a college coach, I've had not clandestine, but separate conversations with the African-American kids on the team. Not to, lock, not to block anybody else out, but to let them know you're seen differently on this campus. You have to act in a certain way. You have to conduct yourself this way. This is how it's going to be. Put your hoodie down, do these certain things that I haven't had to have with the white kids on the team. I was wrong. I think I was wrong. And this is bringing all this to mind. I should have the same conversations with everyone so that everyone has a knowledge of, of, of what's happening around them. Even the white kids on my team. This is why she can't wear her hoodie up. Or this is why when you guys are walking together, you should offer for her to do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I've grown in just this certain, uh, uh, this short amount of time is that I need to have those racial conversations with everybody, not just the African-American kids. I love that. That's a that's a really great example, Tom. And I'm, I'm sure you're not the only one that has has experienced that. Um, Kathy, and this relates to one of the questions that has come in the chat. As as a white person, you're not you're not coaching anymore, um, <clears throat> despite your little league success, as you self proclaimed success. Um, but as a someone We're lost, <laughs> someone has, someone who oversees coaches, um, how how are you able to communicate to your coaches and then to your student athletes, both uh, of color and your white student athletes, that you are an ally? And how could white coaches communicate that in a way that's different than just Tom described because he's a black coach? Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about this, um, and I supervise I supervise women's basketball, women's lacrosse, and field hockey. Um, all white coaches, their staffs aren't all completely white, but the head coaches are white. Um, and I first want to say that I, I'm so inspired by Tom and all of you coaches in terms of just the expansion of your role. <laughs> you know, your role has not always been this. A hundred years ago, your role was just to put players on the field and teach X's and O's and hope that people left the game not injured. And today, we all, administrators, the NCAA, the community, the parents, we're asking you to do so much. Um, so I just want to say thank you and don't be hard on yourselves. Um, so with that, I, you know, I come to supervision with that in mind and, and hope that I'm supporting my coaches, but challenging them to obviously do the best that they can as it relates to this. Um, so I came up with sort of three ideas that I would want my coaches to think about um, as it relates to this. And I think the first one is to learn. Um, learn about yourself. Figure out what your own blind spots are. Um, do some work around your own racial identity development. Um, understand some key terms right now. Um, your student athletes are learning about them most likely in their classes and it's important for you to understand what racism is, what systemic racism is, what white privilege is, discrimination. Again, you don't have to become an expert or, or get a doctorate in this, but understand some key terminology. Um, and then of course stay up on, on current events um, 
and develop over time a basic understanding of Black American oppression. Again, same thing. You don't have to become an expert, but um, you know, I think our coaches should understand the impacts from slavery to today and mass incarceration and just have some basic understanding um, because your athletes are going to be learning about it, all of your athletes. Um, and the impacts of slavery are still here today. They're still here and they just have different names and different forms and it's most, mostly around policing um, and, and imprisonment. So, so that would be the first one, Amy, would be I'd ask them to learn about themselves and, and develop an understanding of, of what, racist, right, what racism is. Mm -hmm. um, and then to what Tom talked about around communication, I think probably the most important thing that coaches can do as it relates to this is exactly what Tom just role modeled, defining and creating a safe space. You know, there's an, there's an inherent power dynamic, obviously, between Coach Garrick and his female student athletes. Um, that's gonna be there no matter what. However, what he has created when they sit down is a space where the, their, his athletes can talk about him, but can talk about these issues um, in a vulnerable way, in an authentic way, and in an honest way. And the only way they're willing to do that is because he's role modeling that. Um, I'm guessing, Tom, you didn't say this, but I'm guessing you'd be okay if they held you accountable to something that you might say. They might be able to question you on something. And I think that that's very important, especially for white coaches. You know, white coaches, you gotta be willing to be challenged. You have gotta to be. be willing to name it and apologize and say, you are right, thank you for bringing that up. I am not gonna bench you because you are asking me that question or holding me accountable. I'm in this to learn. And that's gonna go 100 miles in terms of developing trust on your team. Coach, did you wanna say something about that? I wanted to agree with you. I wanted to just uh, echo what you were saying. Uh, uh, the trust thing, it's not going to come overnight, but you have to be able to be called out. You have to let these kids have a voice and you have to accept it when you hear it. You can't be afraid of it. You can't be embarrassed by it. You can't be offended by it. Once you open up that door, it has to stay open and you have to mean it. That's right. So, so be authentic. Oh, sorry. I, Amy, I was just going to say, have them be just... Okay, um, so I think for, especially for, well, for all coaches, tell them where you are in your learning journey, wherever it is. And if it might be more through personal stories or through education or through whatever it is, I think it's important to, to put yourself out there and make sure they know that these conversations are democratic and you are going to help hold every all members of your team accountable in these conversations and there's ways to call people out without shaming them and that might be a whole nother conversation um and and that takes some sensitivity and nimbleness and i don't know tom if, if you have any experiences with that um but but safe space um dr martin luther king has um has the beloved community and i think that's interesting to draw on if folks want to look that up how to create a beloved community um and i think there might be a way to use that on and off the court and on and off the field in some ways. Yeah. Sorry, so, Anne, go ahead. No, I want to, um, this is where we are so in sync with conversations and the questions um, <clears throat> without you even seeing the questions in advance. Uh, but you just talked about how coaches can be there for their student athletes and not be defensive and let them call you out. If, if you're a head coach and you, how do you raise these issues to you, Kathy, as a sport administrator or to your AD? Or if you're an assistant coach, how can you raise that to your head coach if they are, you know, being racist explicitly, implicitly, or whatever? How can you do that in the power dynamic that mm -hmm. exists within our employment structures? Do you want me to answer or have coach? Both, one or both. Coach, go ahead. Do you want to go? Well, I, I think there has to be a, a certain level of risk reward, right? Um, if we're going to incite change, you have to risk something. So uh, I'm willing to take those risks. If I have to go to my AD uh, with an issue and I know it could cost me as far as my, my rehiring or my extension or me keeping my job, is it the right thing to do? 
I have to balance. Is that the right thing to do? There's going to be issues where I have to go to my athletic director this year. I know who wants to kneel, who wants to put their fist up, who wants to wear. I'm committed to taking those issues to him at the cost of whatever it might be, because I know it's the right thing to do. And I think that's what people have to balance out um, for themselves individually, but I'm committed to it. Uh, I know this issue is bigger than me. Uh, do I want to lose my job? Of course not. Do I think that'll be the end result? I hope not, because I know where my heart is. I know where my integrity is. And I know that if the, the, the young people on my team feel so strongly as they need to make a statement, then I'm going to help them do that no matter what the cost. Yeah. Kathy, how about from an administrative perspective? I mean, you deal with, you get trained in retaliation of all forms uh, as on a, on, a, on a campus and in a part of a big university system. Um, but how can, how does, on this particular issue, mm -hmm. uh, given the times and given the attention, we have to have an opportunity, I think, to allow people at all levels to, <clears throat> as they manage up, manage up in this way. Like, what advice do you have to the assistant coaches and head coaches today on how to try to have that conversation? Oh, okay, I thought your question was more about how do I invite the conversation, but your question is really more around how can they come yeah. to me? Yeah. Yeah, well, someone, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I get what you're asking. Um, if I haven't built a culture with the coaches that I work with, where they don't feel that they can come to me with this topic or other topics or concerns that they might have with something I said or a policy I'm instituting, then I'm not doing a great job as a leader. It is my responsibility, given the privilege platform that I hold as a senior administrator, to um, invite comments, invite constructive criticism, and engage in this dialogue. Um, I have, I, it is also my responsibility as our ADs, one of our ADs, senior administrators, to advise Jeff to create and enhance and foster this culture. I'm fortunate that I can challenge Jeff um, and I can ask and I can push him around these issues and I don't feel fearful that I'm gonna lose my, my position um, because that's the culture we've created among our team. So I don't know how many of, of the coaches I work with are on the call, but I hope that if you're listening to this, you know, and I, I hope you do know that I, I expect to be challenged because I wanna get better as an administrator too, just like our coaches wanna get better. And so Amy, that's the piece that, um... And Kathy, like I told you, this is why I love talking to you because you kind of center me and you galvanize my, my thoughts. That's the piece that I didn't say. I'm not a rebel, but my athletic director, Peter Casey, has created such a culture in our, in our administration that I would feel comfortable going to him and talking. So it goes hand in hand. It goes hand in hand. I'm, I'm not out there shooting wild. Like I know that if I come with something that's rational, well thought out and principled, I can feel safe coming to him with it. So it goes hand in hand. Yeah. And actually is a really good topic, a future topic for our, like truly like an administrator section or, or topic so that we're, we're sure, uh, you know, I know I feel confident that our nine ADs and administrators have the same experience that Peter, that you, you mentioned about Peter at Lowell and Jeff at UVM, but I, I'm not on campus every day. You know, I don't understand the culture uh, <clears throat> in each of our, our campus communities. And so that's something we'll put in the queue to make sure our administrators, our senior administrators um, can, can learn as just as, as this group is learning. I think that's really, really important to have the right tools to deal with some of this stuff. Um, we're winding down. We've got five, four to five minutes left. There's one, there's one more question in the queue that I want to, I want to make sure we get to. And then if others have questions, still put them in there, even if we don't have time to get to them today. Uh, we can certainly follow up via email or, or just might inspire us for future topics, uh, future spreaders bet conversations. But the last question is about hiring. And I think this came up a little bit in each of your conversations. Um, and it's, it's specific to Tom. Um, have you, what kind of challenges, if any, I don't want to make any assumptions, but no. what challenges, if any, have you encountered <clears throat> as a black man in the coaching profession and trying to get that assistant job and then a head job? Um, many, multiple, right? My, my first head coaching job on women's basketball was at my, my alma mater. So I'm thinking that's why I got that job. 
Was I qualified? Hell yes. But that's why I got that job. And I was summarily dismissed from that job. Um, and then I became an assistant coach. So here, here's the thing. Um, and I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way, but we're on this call for a reason, right? To be transparent, to be as open and honest as possible. African-Americans have a place in basketball because the highest percentage of the people who are playing are African-Americans. So coaches, head coaches need, they're slots on each staff that are almost intended for young black people because you have to recruit black kids. You have to go into their house and sit with their mom and their dad and show them that they're going to be taken care of. They're going to be understood when they get on campus, they're going to provide some um, unique situations and how to deal with those. So you need somebody on camp on your staff who can help you with that. Right? So there's going to be a number of slots for African-American people as far as the assistant coaches, but there is 100% definitely a ceiling at that position. How many division one programs are there? 300 and some odd? Yeah, How many three. African American head coaches are there in women's basketball? There you go. There's the ceiling. And it's with every sport, the NFL, the NBA, major league baseball, it trickles down to us too. I don't know how we combat that, get over that, get through that, uh, hiring practices, affirmative action, and, and, those, and, and those things are going by the wayside. And here's the invisible barricade. People are going, well, why should you guys get a hand up or a leg up in the recruiting process? And how do you get the benefit that I don't get? We're all in the same position. We're never in the same position. We started so far behind that it's always gonna be a constant catch up process for an African American person. And when you look at it, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be on a soapbox here, but if you look at the percentages, are you telling me that the African American kid is good enough to compete on the floor, but the African American adult is not good enough, smart enough, capable enough to lead them? So that's basically the unwritten barrier rule that we're fighting against, um, that our counterparts are, are, are more inclined, more adept at leading and running the teams than we are. But our kids can play on the teams and get the accolades for whoever's leading the team. So there isn't an invisible barrier. We just have to keep kicking at the door. Uh, we just have to keep showing that we're capable, showing that we're willing to do the work, which we most definitely 100% are. Um, and we have to have people in positions of hiring who are thinking the same way. Yeah, and I, I'll just <clears throat> sort of address that in closing and then answer a couple of the other questions that have come up since we're right at one o'clock. I think one of the, you just sit on one of the, what I view in the, put in the reactionary bucket, every point in time when either a black coach gets hired or they get fired, pro or college, like you said, Tom, there's this you know, brief outcry of we've got to do something. We'll set up an internship program. We'll set up this. We'll rejigger this rule or whatever. But then it, it fades. And then mm -hmm. we go five or 10 years and the numbers still are what they were five or 10 years ago. Yep. And I'm hopeful <clears throat> that um, it, this is definitely not going to be something that happens overnight, but that, it, again, we can put together some like permanent changes and really get people to look at this because this is a whole topic in and of itself. Uh, the disparity between head coaches in certain sports and, and, the, and the athletes that, that are playing in them. Um, so a couple other questions I think are more just like, what's, what's next? What's next for <clears throat> the America East Conference? What's next for Spread Respect? As I said before, this is a work in progress, most definitely. Uh, we will have future Spread Respect conversations at some level of frequency for sure. This isn't going to be a, a once a month thing. I think we're thinking, <clears throat> you know, every two or three weeks. Um, to keep the conversation and dialogue going. If you have topic suggestions, we certainly have a few that we've, we've jotted down in our notes uh, for future conversations, please let us know. If you are willing to participate or you have uh, you know, speakers you wanna recommend, please let us know. Um, and, and another question, I think, a couple questions were, are we gonna be putting together some resources for our coaches and teams? Absolutely, we will be doing that. Part of it is building <clears throat> that capability and building that inventory of, of resources that can really be useful. And that's where we will need coaches feedback on what's gonna be the most useful for you as a head coach as you, you know, welcome your student athletes back this fall. 
Um, <clears throat> the other, another question was, um, um, are we going to put together some sort of committee or, or task force? And the answer is yes. We are uh, trying to be deliberate with that so that we we build it properly. You know, we're <clears throat> it's sort of looking at to me like a game plan for a really big game. I want to build this properly so that it has staying power. And so that's not just send me one name from all 10, now we have 10 schools, send me all, one name and we put, we get 10 people together. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be thoughtful about the positions that those people represent, whether they're a coach, whether they're the faculty member, whether they're president and what have you, and really be <clears throat> thoughtful. So we will uh, put that together and hope to have a roadmap here in the next few weeks that we will share with our presidents and our athletics directors. Um, and then as we get towards the fall, something that Tom mentioned about, you know, anticipating that student athletes are going to be kneeling or protesting during national anthems or what have you. I think that's what we envision putting in this like team or coach resource packet of how to do that properly, how to work with your student athletes properly. I know that's something that our administrators are keenly focused on as well. And we've also been having conversations with our student, conference student athlete advisory committee. And I know that they're having conversations with their own campus student athlete advisory committee. So uh, this is, as I said, a work in progress, uh, but we are committed to change. We are open to ideas. Uh, we cannot <laughs> refuse good ideas to help us move this thing forward. So um, I just wanna thank Tom and Kathy again for your participation. I could talk to you guys all day. I really could. This is fascinating stuff. Um, I'm sure we will invite you back uh, at some point in time. Um, but I appreciate your efforts to date and what I know the, the good work that you're going to do on your campuses and within our conference and even nationally as we go forward. So thank you everyone uh, for, for joining us today and we hope you, you come back for our next Retrospect Conversation. Amy, Thanks, thank Amy. you for including me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Good to see you, Kathy.